welcome to Red Deer Public Library's Travel Memories Program for April, a virtual edition. Um, my name's Priscilla. I've been hosting this program for about seven years, and we're fortunate to have Jerry Fian joining us again. He's a um, award-winning travel writer and photographer, and um, when he retired about a decade ago, he started to travel seriously and make these presentations available to us. So we've been really lucky that he's uh, spoken three times before in person. In June 2016, he talked about his trip to the Yukon, December 2017 to Bhutan, and December 2018 to Kenya, Rwanda, and Zanzibar. And this time we get to join him in Egypt. So um, I think that's all I want to say to introduce you, Jerry, and you can start and share your screen and do your presentation. Thanks, Priscilla. Uh, I am uh, doing this presentation from lovely Kimberley, British Columbia, where my wife Florence and I have moved to and we are living here now. It's uh, missing red deer, but but uh, Kimberley's a pretty awesome place. And during the pandemic, et cetera, it's been an awesome place to be, uh, having to be locked down because we get to go and do all the outdoor things. And so it's been great. In fact, didn't you say that yesterday you got to do two things on the same day? Yeah, I, I skied in the morning and golfed in the afternoon. <laughs> What's better than that? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, we're the, the advantage of doing this virtually is that you can still join us, so that's great. Well, that's right, and it's it's. I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to uh, share my screen now. And uh, is that working, Priscilla? It is. Okay, so uh, we traveled to Egypt in the at the end of 2018, so about two and a half years ago. Um, Obviously, there's been no travel going on for the last year and a bit. And so uh, this, uh, although it was uh, two and a half years ago, it seems like it wasn't very long ago because it was one of the last trips that we were able to do before things got shut down. Uh, Egypt is a, a really interesting place. Um, uh, a lot of people seem to be frightened to go there um, for a number of reasons. Um, in association with 9-11, the Arab Spring that occurred uh, in the early uh, 2010s. And uh, so when we were there, there were very few tourists and the, uh, the Egyptians were extremely happy to see us and we were treated very, very well. We didn't encounter any fear uh, related to um, feeling uncomfortable. Uh, quite the contrary, we felt very, very uh, looked after the whole time and very safe. Um, so, um, I'm going to start the presentation and um, just going to start by showing a map of Egypt. And uh, you can see from here that uh, we, we flew into Luxor. So we flew from uh, Paris into Luxor, which is here, which is about, about halfway down the Nile River. Uh, and we boarded a, a boat there called a Dahabia, very, very interesting boat. And we sailed for a week from Luxor down to Aswan, which is the end of the line because that's where the giant dam is located. And then uh, we spent some time in Aswan. Then we went, we flew. You can see that my number two, an airplane, we flew to uh, Abu Simbel, which is the location for uh, an incredible monument that was um, brought up land due to the flooding and the creation of Lake Nassar, all of the monuments and all of the land and all of the fertile parts of the Nile River where the big lake is were submerged in water. And we spent a few days in Abu Simbel and then we flew to Cairo where we spent some uh, about another three or four days. And then from there, at the end of our trip, we flew over to Sharm el Sheikh, which is on the Red Sea. And we spent a week there uh, bathing in the Red Sea and, uh, and exploring the Sinai Peninsula. So that is the, um, the geography of what we did. And so I'm just going to start the presentation now. 
And I've got, uh, so this is when we boarded the boat. And these are uh, where we began is at uh, Luxor, uh, which is uh, where one of the, uh, probably the best place in all of Egypt for seeing the ancient tombs and monuments is at Luxor, about halfway down the Nile River in Egypt. Um, this is where Karnak and the Valley of the Kings are, which are, other than the Great Pyramids, which are located in Cairo, this is probably the greatest concentration and the most famous of all of the, um, all of the uh, ancient uh, uh, monuments and temples. So this was, uh, the, this is the, da we were a flotilla of three Dahabias. And uh, interestingly, what happens is that in the Nile River, it flows from the south to the north. That's the way that the, it drains uh, from Central Africa, drains into the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Um, but the prevailing winds are from the north to the south. So historically, the Egyptians were able to take advantage of the fact that the river was flowing north, but the winds were blowing south to use these sails on these boats to very slowly work their way upstream, which is to the south. And in fact, that is what enabled the Egyptians to create all of the, the, the pyramids and all of the um, uh, uh, monuments, because what they did is they were able to, uh, they would quarry the, gra the granite, the limestone way up river, and then they would wait for the Nile River to rise in the spring flood. Then they would load all of the giant stones onto boats, sail them down to Cairo to where the, the great pyramids of Giza are located. And then they could unload these giant blocks of stone and build the pyramids. And then they could sail the boat back upstream and do it again uh, during the flood. So it's a really a fascinating, um, it, 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 when the absence of that geography and that those, those uh, the wind, that never would have happened. The boat itself was absolutely spectacular. The, the, we were, um, the, we were um, uh, really well accommodated. There was only uh, nine guests aboard the boat. No, 16 guests. Um, six of us were Canadian. The, um, uh, the balance were Americans. And uh, the boat would normally have like 70 people. So we were, we were just treated like pharaohs and queens. Um, what I did is I took a photograph at each temple we stopped at. So on the Dahabia, we sailed on the boat for six days. And I stopped, uh, as we stopped at each temple every day, there would be a, spot, a place to stop. And we had an, uh, an Egyptian guide take us and show us the temple. And I took a, a photograph of the little ticket we were given so that, I, so that I would remember where the heck we had been. So if you see these tickets, that'll tell you where we were. was our, our Egyptologist that you just saw. And interestingly, these um, uh, cartouches were created thousands of years ago. But when the uh, British army came to uh, overthrow Napoleon in, uh, and to uh, deal with some of the uprisings in Africa, in the early 1800s, they came and they, they did graffiti. So you can see this fella here in 1819, somebody else here in 1837. And they uh, they engraved graffiti into these 
3000 year old cartouches. So as I said in the story I wrote, uh, Kilroy uh, was here indeed. One of the interesting uh, things that we learned is um, the reason that some of the engravings and cartouches and monuments in the tombs are in such good shape is that they were neglected for thousands of years and became buried in the sand of the desert. And um, you could, you, we could see the level above which the sand had not protected the monuments and they were often uh, obliterated uh, for religious reasons by um, the uh, Christians that came in the first centuries AD. Um, and so what happened is that when the monuments and the tombs were restored, they removed all of the sand and, and they were all perfectly preserved underneath that barrier of sand. And so the, uh, the effect of time on the monuments was actually a good thing because it actually preserved them for the future. We were pulled by, by uh, tugs came with us uh, for when there was no wind or for when there was more delicate uh, maneuvering required. And uh, so we were under sail some of the time, certainly not all the time. And I like doing this time lapse thing. You'll see quite a few of these. I just find it really quite entertaining to have this. Uh, you can see the boat, the, the boat beside us. There's nobody on that one either. I've got this little background music that I bought that is kind of cool. It's very Arabic and very much like what you hear all day long. You can see it's very arid as soon as you get away from the river. We're only, only about a mile from the river here and it's very arid. There is a, uh, a famous little story. Uh, the captain, his nickname for some re reason that we could never figure out, his nickname was Humpty Dumpty. Uh, and as you can see, he was very, very serious at times to the point of like almost being frightful or frightening. Uh, the rest of the time he was very relaxed and laughing and, and um, but he would go through that maneuver. Every time we would pull over to uh, shore, which we did 
very, very often and every night. Uh, he, every time we would pull over or leave from shore, he would go through these histrionics where he was yelling and screaming and pointing. And, and uh, one day, and he did it every day, uh, two or three times a day. So one day, just before he went into that routine, I stepped into place where he was going to do it. And I started in my pigeon uh, Arabic, shouting and screaming and gesticulating. And the, the crew were absolutely dumbfounded. They were all standing and they all looked at me. And then collectively, they burst out laughing together. And the captain looked at me and then he burst out laughing. And then after, after that, they all wanted me to do the imitation four or five times a day. And then I started imitating the different crew members. And it was, uh, it was extremely hilarious and everybody got a huge kick out of it. And the, and the, the crew, they were, you know, they were sailors, great, big, stout, strong, stern men, but they also were like little kids and they had a tremendous sense of humor and were very, very, um, uh, very polite and very open. Now, one thing we absolutely did not expect was that we would be swimming in the Nile River. And in fact, what happened is the owner, which a lady from Paris who was on another boat, one morning we were having breakfast and all of a sudden a body floated by and it was her swimming. And I thought she had fallen overboard, but she was swimming very casually. And so we kind of, well, what's going on there? So it, we learned that it was fine to swim in the Nile River. There's, uh, there's, there's nothing to worry about. The water's clean. I wouldn't drink it, but it's clean. It's it's beautiful. There are no uh, alligators or crocodiles there. And so as soon as we learned that, we, we did that. And so every day uh, after breakfast and after we would do uh, a visit to a temple, we would pull over and we would uh, jump into the Nile River and we would, we would walk upstream about 400 yards. And then we would jump into the river and we would drift down to the boat and have the most beautiful, relaxing swim in the river and feel the current, the strength of the... Feel the strength of that incredible water. We tried to swim upstream against this, but it was impossible. You could, the best you could do would be just to, to stay even. And it was very refreshing. The temperature outside, we were there in uh, October or November. And... Um, and... Uh, the, the weather was just lovely. It never got hotter than 30. The further south we got, the warmer it got, but it was at, and it, it, at night it would be 14 or 16. This was also an interesting evening. What happened is that I take my ukulele with me everywhere that we go in the world. And I brought my ukulele out at uh, sort of cocktail hour. And I was, and of course, just before when the, when the sun goes down in the tropics, of course, it gets dark very, very quickly. But I played a few songs on my ukulele and... Um, the, I noticed that the crew was slowly coming up from down below decks and coming up onto the where we were and gathering around watching me play the ukulele and 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 then um, I no, soon noticed that basically the entire crew was there and they were very politely watching me and then all of a sudden it was their turn to go and we had the most incredible spontaneous experience again because of this dumb ukulele I take with me everywhere. Are we all right?
this was interesting because this day was the first time in four years that it had rained in the desert. And uh, the, um, the crew and our guides and everybody was absolutely ecstatic. They were so excited to see the rain after four years of drought. Like the drought does. So you can see that he's actually controlling both the sail and the rudder. Uh, and um, I mean, it, it, he, they make it look easy as people that are good at things tend to do. But it was, um, it was uh, really fascinating that they could control the, the entire, uh, these are big boats. Uh, you can do that just with one guy sitting back there and moving the rudder back and forth and controlling the sails. Turn that music down for a while. Give everybody a break. This was interesting here. Uh, this is actually where the limestone was quarried. A lot of the limestone that was quarried that went that ended up in uh, the temp the pyramids of Giza at Cairo, which is a long ways north of here. And so you can see the lines in the upper portion there where the blocks were quarried out. Each block would weigh uh, at least a, a ton. And in the Great Pyramid of Cheops or Khufu, uh, there are, I think, 2.3 million blocks. So you can imagine the manpower and what was involved in the engineering in order to get those blocks from up there to... Uh, Cairo, which is about a thousand kilometers to the north. The lower portion there where the holes are were actually tombs and that would have been flooded every year by the Nile. So um, you can see basically that the water would go up to the, to uh, the Nile would flood up to the, pretty much the top of the quarry there. This is the X-rated portion of the show. Again, you can see we're just, we're under sail and we're just barely moving. But over the course of time, just give it a few hours and you, you know, we're probably going three or four miles an hour working our way up the Nile River here. Dominoes is a big thing there, as is the Publi Bubbly, the uh, water pipe. Our meals were unbelievable. Very refreshing on a hot Egyptian afternoon. You can see that this god has the head of a crocodile. 
which is at Com Ombo. And this is one of the uh, temples where the upper portion was obliterated and the lower portion intact. That is the cook who fell down laughing, crying. He was so excited when I did this imitation of the uh, captain. Got some good light that day with the Dahabia. It was relaxing. This uh, part of Egypt was, was desperately poor. Uh, this is uh, actually very close to Aswan where we departed the boat. And um, it was not a great place to see. And just the, the absolute poverty there was very apparent. And they were so, the Egyptians were so happy to see us and so welcoming. And they are really, really struggling, especially um, the southern part of the Nile. Um, really hard hard days are happening there and i'm sure it's a lot worse now i think this is our last breakfast here <laughs> so as I said at the beginning, uh, when we arrived in Aswan, we caught uh, an airplane to Abu Simbel, which is about a 45 minute flight. You can, you can drive there, it's about a four hour drive, but typically there's not a lot to see at Abu Simbel. There's just the temple and there's a museum there. So uh, we elected to fly because we basically just spent part, just half a day there and then, and then, uh, and then flew out. Um, but it's a really, really fascinating feat of engineering so this is Ramses and Nefertiri, uh, his wife, uh, two of them each. And um, this was originally on a corner of the Nile River and a gorge. And it was built, uh, I think about 3,500 years ago. And uh, what happened is that at Nassar, uh, the president of Egypt in the 1960s decided that Egypt needed to get some electricity and some hydropower and to control the, the flow of the Nile River. So they built the Aswan Dam, which created the, at that time the world's largest uh, artificial lake, which was coincidentally became known as called Lake Nassar. When they did that, it took years for it to fill, but the Egyptian government did not make any efforts to protect all of the tombs that were upstream of where the dam was going to be, where the dam was built. And that was all going to be flooded because these, all of the temples were located very close to the river, but just above the flood line. Um, so when the, when the lake was created, there were hundreds and hundreds of temples that were going to be submerged permanently. 
And so at Abu Simbel, some uh, European engineers came up with a plan to take and slice these giant uh, edifices into razor thin pieces and then move them from the river uh, edge up a few hundred feet above the ultimate level of the lake and then put it all back together. So when you're looking here at the statues, those are all the original statues, but the mountain in the background is an artificial mountain that they created to house Abu Simbel. And they also, they also kept the, the area inside, which was uh, um, like uh, a temple or a church. And um, it was all completely reassembled. It's just absolutely amazing feat of architecture. I mean, of engineering. Technically, photographs are not permitted, but if you if you just give a little bakshish to the guy uh, running the door, you can take as many pictures as you want. It's an incredible place. They like their hubbly bubbly, the uh, the hookahs. They use a sweet a sweet tobacco. So um, we were on a dahabia, which is the, a large boat. You can, if you ever, if you if you decide to go to Egypt, I would really, really highly recommend the dahabia. It's a slow, luxurious way of seeing the Nile and the temples. There are other ways of doing it. Um, a lot of people just take what amounts to almost like a car ferry, which belches a whole bunch of diesel and, and gets from um, Luxor to Aswan very quickly in the course of about two days. And they, they stop irregularly. And you do get to see the Nile, but you don't get to have this experience that we had. Uh, and it's also dirty and noisy. Uh, we saw those going by mostly empty. The other smaller crafts that have been plying the, the Nile River for millennia are these felucas. They are small, one, one masted, uh, one sail, uh, one with, with one sail. And we just did a day trip in the felucca, um, which was part of our tour. Um, we uh, uh, just did it to go and visit a Nubian village and uh, to ride a camel, which I guess everybody has to do. And riding a camel is not that easy. <laughs> you tend to get thrown around quite a bit. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world. I've, I've ridden enough camels in my life now that I don't need to ride anymore. But there's, a, again, a spontaneous musical thing happened here. So one of the uh, impacts of the creation of Lake uh, Nassar was that the local inhabitants who were Nubians, um, darker skinned Egyptians in the south of, of Egypt, all of those villages that were bordering on the Nile, uh, again, upstream of the new dam, kind of like the temples, they, all these villages were going to be submerged. And so the government relocated all of the Nubians and, their, uh, in, and then constructed these Nubian style houses for them above the level of uh, the, the old flood. But the absence of the flood now means that basically everything is arid because the river doesn't change and it doesn't get uh, refertilized every year. And, um, uh, but, uh, Again, I had no, no idea that there was this cultural distinction between the, um, the uh, lighter skinned Egyptians in the north and the Nubians in the south. They are all Arabic though. And, uh, the, fun, and the, the main religion of course is um, Islam.
this is the cataracts. Uh, um, there are five cataracts, I believe it's five. And uh, where the Aswan Dam was created was in a, a cataract, um, which is of course a narrowing of the, a, a narrowing of the um, river and a good place to build a dam. This is a, a sort of a, an accident of fate that was, would, would enable, that enabled us to uh, appreciate just what the Egyptians were able to accomplish. This is an obelisk. It was the largest obelisk ever created. And it was, as it was being uh, manufactured, it split right here. And the result of that is that it was useless. It was of no value. And so it was left in place. And it's been there for thousands of years now, sitting like that. And of course, it was again covered in sand, but that has been uh, removed. And so now we today get to see what, what the Egyptians were up to. So this obelisk would have been, again, in this limestone quarry at the flood level. And what they would have done is cut it so that it was ready to be moved. When the flood came, it would have flooded up to this level. They would have picked up this rock, put it onto a barge, floated it downstream, probably to Luxor, where they would have prepared um, a pit where they would slide the obelisk into the pit and then through a series of pulleys and ropes, um, pull it upright and then remove, and then when the, when the water subsided, remove the sand from around it so it would free stand. And that's a, a bad description of, the, of the, well, the engineering involved, but it's, it's absolutely incredible that three or four or 5,000 years ago, the engineering that existed to move incredibly gigantic, heavy pieces of stone without the benefit of any motorized equipment it's, it's absolutely amazing. And again, only because it cracked and was useless are we able to enjoy it because it was left behind, discarded. So when we left Aswan, we flew to the capital Cairo, which is uh, a megalopolis of millions and millions of people, and also one of the most uh, traffic congested cities in the world, because actually the, the vehicles there are really quite new, good shape, but the infrastructure, the city, the roads were, were built a few thousand years ago, and so they're not really designed to accommodate um, this much traffic. Obviously this is a new thoroughfare, but that's about how quickly things move in the thoroughfare. The Egyptian museum is where all of the antiquities are housed. These people are 3000 years old. That's Nefertiti, the goddess of fertility. And this is where Tutankhamun, uh, his finery is located. His original throne his original headpiece that was on his sarcophagus. Also, this is where Ramses II is located. And this fella is 30, he's just going into his 34th century. That doesn't look too bad for a guy that's that old. Um, he is the guy that, uh, uh, was the founder of the Valley of the Kings at Luxor. He's also the one who uh, was, um, he and his wife were the ones that were honored with the temple that became Abu Simbel. And those things happened 3,300 years ago. And he has been uh, in this state ever since. And he is in this climate controlled uh, uh, sarcophagus, which we all get to see in, in the Museum of um, Egyptology in Cairo. This is a brand new one, by the way, just opened in, I think, February of 2021. They're, they actually were moving, I saw an article just a few days ago that they're moving all of the, these um, 
uh, mummies, including Ramses. The people were, they're, they're shy, but they're also, as you can see, they're, they're very outgoing. Um, they, you had to be courteous and polite and ask if you could take a photograph, but um, they were more than willing to share and um, extremely friendly and really, really great, happy to see us. This is the ancient souk, which is uh, in Cairo. We, we did a night of uh, Arabic cooking. And then we went to the pyramids of Giza. And so, uh, and that is actually, you can see the size of those stones. That is the, the great pyramid of Cheops. And we were able to get inside. We had to pay a little bit extra to get in, but we were actually to go, able to go and walk up into the burial chamber of Cheops, which was hidden inside of the pyramid. And by the time it was discovered in the 18th century, it had been looted. You can see from the, uh, there's kind of two layers uh, on the pyramids. So what happened is that uh, in order to build these pyramids, they didn't take these blocks and build stuff, well, obviously starts at the bottom, but they didn't haul the blocks up that entire height to the top. What they did is they backfilled all of this with sand as they were building it. And there's 2.3 million blocks, each weighing a ton in this building, in this, in here. It's about 600 feet high. And uh, they had to backfill this with sand for acres and acres and acres, and then put the blocks one at a time, which they had floated up the Nile. I don't know how they got them from the Nile to here, drag them. And then after the uh, original pyramid was built in rough, limestone and granite it was capped with white limestone so they started at the top and worked their way down as they removed that sand and it was capped with uh this beautiful white limestone but over the course of the century that was all looted and removed so that only this uh pyramid has any remnants of that white limestone Again, you can see how arid it is around there. And I didn't know that the Great Sphinx was located right there. So the Great Sphinx and the rumor is that Napoleon's army shot the nose off. Uh, our guide said that that was not the case. Um, but the, uh, the uh, Great Sphinx is located right adjacent to and in the same area as the, uh, the three um, giant pyramids of uh, Giza. I think that's maize or maize leaves uh, that that guy's taking as fodder for his donkey. We went to a uh, Somme et Lumière, which is a sound and light show uh, at the Great Pyramids. We went to Alexandria for a day, which is the ancient capital. It's on the Mediterranean Ocean. Uh, frankly, it was a, a long day. We had to get up very early. We got to see uh, uh, Anwar Sadat was, was uh, shot by his own army uh, while he was overseeing a parade. Um, so we had a long day to go to Alexandria, and uh, there are a couple of things that used to be there that are famous, but um, uh, they're gone now, including the ancient library of Alexandria and the ancient lighthouse. They were the, two of the original seven wonders of the world. Neither of them are there anymore. So it was kind of a long day, and frankly, um, if I had limited time in Egypt, I would probably skip Alexandria. Cairo was... Uh, was, um, was um, very interesting. And the museum at Cairo is, is really, really an important thing. Um, they love thick Turkish coffee with whole cadamon in it. So you can imagine how that would keep you up if you drank that a little bit late at night. Thick Turkish coffee with, I didn't, I didn't care for it, frankly. So from 
from Cairo, the last leg of our journey, we went to Sharm el Sheikh, which is on the Red Sea. And um, what happened is this is the Sinai Peninsula, which was the subject of the Six Day War. What happened is in this little narrows right here, it's only less than a kilometer wide and it's called the Strait of Qatar. And uh, 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 Nassar decided that he was going to blockade that to prevent the Israelis from being able to get access via the Mediterranean or the Red, sorry, via the Red Sea to their only southern port. Um, and uh, so he blockaded that strip of water, preventing the Israelis from having access to the uh, Red Sea. And the Israelis responded immediately by decimating the entire Egyptian air force. They didn't even get off the ground. The, the Israelis basically bombed all of the um, airports containing army airplanes. And within six days, the uh, Israelis had gone all the way down the Sinai Peninsula to Sharm el Sheikh, which is a long ways from home. They had taken over the, uh, they were basically at the Suez Canal and the Egyptians surrendered. They unconditionally su said, sorry about that. Uh, we will undo the blockade. The only thing is once that damage was done, the Israelis weren't prepared to just unilaterally give everything back. And so the Israelis kept Sharm el Sheikh for about a decade, I believe. And uh, they, did, uh, they, they did give back the Suez Canal fairly shortly. Uh, but um, uh, the Israelis, Kind of liked Sharm el Sheikh, and what they did is they built a couple of resorts that they uh, that the um, Israeli tourists went to for a decade or so, and um, then they abandoned it and gave it back to the Egyptians. But the Sinai Peninsula was left as one of the most heavily mined um, areas of the world, so it's extremely dangerous. You have to make sure you stay in all of the marked roads, and uh, the the, uh, the mines are still there. But it's become a gigantic tourist des destination for people from all over the world, uh, largely Russians, Ukrainians, um, the English, um, and I guess a few Canadians. Beautiful resort right on the Red Sea. A beautiful modern mosque. We spent a day at Ras Mohammed, which is a national park. Um, the above ground, the above water part is obviously very bleak. The part below sea level, though, is absolutely beautiful, full of clear, clear water and coral. I got a chance to go scuba diving when I was there. Then, um, then we did a day trip um, up into the Sinai Peninsula. We did a few of these. And we explored a dry wadi, which is basically a, a, a riverbed that will have river water in it occasionally. But that was this entire... Um, um, uh, valley was created by erosion from water like so when it does rain there it rains torrentially but it doesn't happen very often these two young gals were a real treat trying to communicate so there is a famous place in Egypt called the Blue Hole. There's another one called in, in Belize called the Blue Hole. And actually, uh, Florence and I have been fortunate enough to see both of those Blue Holes in the last few years. With the same friends, we did a uh, catamaran trip uh, for 10 days sailing through Belize and seeing some of the most incredible coral in the world together with this, the Blue Hole there. And then very shortly after that, we went and saw the Blue Hole in Egypt and it, was, it is renowned uh, for scuba diving, for free divers, but the snorkeling was also really fantastic. Uh, the water was extremely clear and, um, and, uh, and we're all really avid snorkelers. So you can just see how clear the water is. This is called a surgeon fish because that orange line at the back is actually like a knife that they cut anybody that gets anywhere near them.
You can see how clear that was. I'm probably going down there 20, 25 feet to where the coral is. And there's a big, long band of coral. That is the actual edge of the blue hole, which descends another 400 feet or so. And people actually free dive that. In other words, they go down with a single breath to the bottom and come back up. So I went down 25 feet. That's about it. We had a, an interesting day again on the Sinai Peninsula. We did, these were all day trips from that resort. We went to St. Catherine's Monastery, which is the oldest uh, continuously occupied monastery and the oldest continuously maintained library in the world. It has been looked after by these monks, Christian monks, um, Coptic Christian monks. They've been looking after it since the fourth century. Um, some of the oldest manuscripts, biblical manuscripts in the world are located uh, in the monastery. And it is also, it is situated at the base of Mount Sinai. And uh, in the Bible, you will remember that that is the place where Moses was given the Ten Commandments. And so that monastery was then built there at the base of Mount Sinai. And uh, we were told that this was the burning bush, which I thought was a bit surprising, given that uh, I thought the burning bush was up the mountain, but I guess it's migrated down into the courtyard of the monastery somehow. Another long day uh, from start to finish, because um, it's a few hour drive. We were under intense security here because there had been some extremist activities that occurred. It was a long day, as you can see. There were some extremist activities that have been happening there over the last couple of decades. So um, we had to be accompanied by uh, an army guy, by a local guide, by our guide, by a driver. So there was almost as many employees working in, in the, in the in the van as there was us. So that is the end of the presentation. This is the last night at uh, Sharm El Sheikh. Um, if you are interested in reading more of my stories, um, there is the website where you can go to. There are a lot of stories there. Egypt, as I mentioned, is really in, in, in uh, tough, tough times. It was tough when we were there. It's going to be worse now. We were really, really well looked after. Uh, we felt safe the entire time. It's a, it's a beautiful country. The people are lovely. Um, the, um, you know, to go to a place where it was the most civilized civilization in the world for thousands of years, and to see that, it's, it was really a spectacular, and, uh, and uh, we, were, we were really, really fortunate to do it. And I would highly recommend it, and it's a nice way to finish off Spending a couple of weeks in Egypt is to spend a week relaxing at the Red Sea. So who did you do your trip with? Yes, um, we, the trip was done with um, Exodus Travel. And um, they did a great job for us. I didn't do the organizing. One of the, our, our fellow travelers is the one that, that did it. So um, Exodus is a pretty large company. They also, we did a trip with them also to Jordan. Uh, subsequent, actually after this, we went to Jordan. That'll be next time, I guess. Um, uh, we also done, they, they're, they're a large company. Um, you, you sort of need to make sure you get a hold of the right person at Exodus so that you have the person that is an expert in that particular region of the world. But um, we had, this entire tour that we did was custom designed for a group of six of us. Often there'll be larger groups um, but we actually had this custom design for just a group of six of us. Obviously, it's much more expensive that way, but we had a, um, the guide, uh, Syed Mansour, was with us all the way from when we met him in Aswan. We, he did all the airplane flights with us, and he was with us for the better part of three weeks. There every morning, looked after us all day long, always with a smile on his face, um, always very, very knowledgeable about all aspects of Egypt. So it was a wonderful experience. 
Um, on the Dahabia, if you're interested in doing that, you can book that directly. Uh, it's through a company called Nur El Nil, which is N O U R E L N I L. I think the N I L is, is a contraction for the Nile. Um, so they have four boats uh, in the fleet, and um, um, you can book that directly. We actually did it through Exodus because it was part of our tour, but you probably could save much, some money by booking the, um, uh, the Dahabia directly through them. The other thing I would really strongly recommend is that you get to the, if you're going to do the, the Dahabia, that you get there about three days early so that you can see the Valley of the Kings. You don't want to sort of just show up and jump on the boat and leave one of the most spectacular um, um, temple complexes in all of Egypt. So don't, uh, yeah, so get there a few days early. And you can do day trips from, um, from Luxor. So what camera did you use? Because your pictures are wonderful. You're, you know, the, the time-lapse photography, you, know, you didn't do all that with your phone. I don't know. The time-lapse, this, this picture here was taken, this one here is taken with my phone because that is a, um, a panorama. Uh, the majority of the pictures, all of the motion pictures are done with my phone. Sorry, if I didn't say my phone, I meant my, this panorama is done with my phone. Um, all of the time-lapse things are done with my phone. It's just really important you have it sitting somewhere stable. And basically, all I do is I turn it on and walk away, and leave it on. In order to get a, de a decent time-lapse, you have to have it going for about five minutes. Because it'll go, that five minutes will turn into about 15 seconds. So if it's shorter than that, it's kind of disruptive. Um, but I would just simply place it somewhere where it was secure, start it going, walk away, and, uh, make, and then come back and get it, um, come back and get it in five minutes. Um, the, the photographs that are, um, that are with telephoto like that, those were all taken with uh, my Sony mirrorless 35, A3500. A, hmm, I'm not using it anymore. Uh, I, uh, but it, you, you, uh, this is, this is, you can't get pictures like this with a camera. That um, people make a lot of mistakes in trying to take pictures of things like a picture of a, of an animal at a distance with their phone, and that's. It won't work. It doesn't do any good to blow it up. It's just, you know, you're, pick, you're limited to the pixels that you got in the camera. So all of the outdoor short range photographs I did with my phone, anything that involved shooting from a distance like this was with a telephoto lens of my high, my high end um, mirrorless camera, my Sony. And what about the underwater pictures? The underwater is an old, hundred dollar camera that I've got that takes great video underwater it doesn't take very it doesn't and it doesn't take good pictures underwater it only takes good video underwater and I can't figure that one out but um so and the other thing is if you as you surface there's water on the lens and so it's hard to transition between below the water and above the water so um that's not a great idea with that with that camera but it's just a cheap underwater camera. Um, you can't use it for scuba diving because you can't go below about 30 feet with it. So it would just, it would uh, be destroyed by getting down to depths where the water pressure is high. But you can, you can go down to 10 meters, which is like, nobody's going below 10 meters when they're snorkeling. So um, it, it takes fantastic video. Um, mm -hmm. The underwater still photography, I've just, I've given up on with that camera just even with a flash, it just doesn't work. But for some reason, the video works great. Use what you got, right? So while we have this picture on the screen, can you talk a bit more about the sails? Are they made of cotton or linen or something? Or Well, I don't know. But, okay. Because uh, the sails we have in sailboats now are mostly synthetics, right, that we have here. Yeah. Um, you know, they probably were originally were something different than what they're made of now. I'm sure they're just using the best material available for, for any kind of boats. But the um, uh, you can see that the way the sails are configured is to catch this, the, they're uh, basically both spinnakers almost, catching the wind from behind. So there's no, there's no tacking. 
Uh, it's just a straight line with that wind. So we, this is looking north up the Nile. The wind is coming from the north to the south, blowing into the current. And as I said, we, we went very slowly, but it was just so luxurious because you're going at a speed where you can actually talk for a moment to, to a shepherd who's standing on the shore. You know, you can say hello and have a couple of words and then he's gone and, and then you move on. It's, it, it, it was really spectacular. And so was the water that clear when you were close to Cairo? It's just, or is it just so clear because you were so far south? I don't know. I would say no. I don't really know because uh, we, you know, we were only on the water from Luxor south to Aswan. I didn't see the water except from the air anywhere north of Luxor. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't want to swim in the water north of Luxor. So, and there would not be any reason to do a sailing trip in that part because all the, 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 um, uh, the majority of the, uh, the temples that are close together are on this section of the Nile, which is in this clean part of the Nile. From Luxor to the north, there would be, they'd be more uh, unevenly dispersed. And then pretty soon you get into getting into, you know, heavily populated areas where obviously the water's not going to be clean and, and clear. And so, you know, again, if you think about it, where we are at here is not very far down, maybe 100 or 200 kilometers downstream of where the water's uh, dumping out of the dam. So that water coming out of the dam is coming out very, very clean. So the water coming out of the dam is clean. And um, so, the, so the Nile stays clean um, for the first few hundred kilometers before there's a, because there's not, there's not very much population and the water start is, is starting clean. Okay. Um, so can I ask a little bit, like you've wonderful pictures of the food that you didn't go into much detail about. Was yeah. there highlights for the food for you or it was just all so good? I'm going I noticed to... the one place where the rice was formed into a pyramid. I thought that was kind of neat. So the, the food is, um, was always served like this. And um, the staff is basically, we're, we're eating the same thing as them. There are some, some, some dishes that they preferred over the stuff that they served us, but they basically would serve us and then, serve, and then eat themselves. Um, you can see there's French fries there, but, but um, there's fish, um, there's rice. Uh, we had the, the, the best meal that we had, the best lunch. I'm just gonna try to find my notes here. Um, the best lunch we had was a bunch of, uh, oh, of course I can't find it. Oh, here we are. Yeah. So that's Nile perch there. So that's freshly knitted Nile perch. Um, we all, we had all, virtually all the meals we had, the, the, um, rice, also fried falafel. Baba ganoush, uh, fresh from the oven, flat bread, mm. uh, tahini, hummus, yogurt sauces, and they were all they weren't heavily spiced in terms of being hot, but they were delicious. Um, all local stuff, all local vegetables, and the desserts were usually pretty simple. Usually just some fruit, uh, or uh, yeah, so. The, uh, we, we were treated really, really well in the food department. Lots of dates or not? Yeah, lots of dates, especially, um, yeah, the dates would be served with dessert, yeah. And so you showed your last breakfast and they were passing out a, a milky looking drink? What, what was that, that actually was some, that was um, uh, in, the, in the afternoon, oh, later okay. that day. Uh, and every, day they would bring out a new fruit juice i don't know what that one was i can't oh, remember okay. okay but there would be some local um fresh squeezed fruit juice served to us at about four o'clock every day wow. and it was something different every day and always delicious wonderful and always so with a, always with a great big smile and a song <laughs> So the flip side of that is any health concerns you might have had with the um, Yeah, uh, we had a couple people on the boat that got quite
quite sick. So there were 16 of us, I said. Um, one lady was confined to quarters for a couple of days. Uh, I would say that probably less than half, but probably four or five people did get sick. I don't, you don't know with food poisoning because that's what it's traveler's diarrhea for sure. It's hard to say when you pick that up because it can take a number of days before it manifests itself with uh, illness. So um, did we get sick because of the food on the boat? Perhaps I didn't get sick, but uh, Florence and I have also made a very, very strong point of ensuring that we do pre-travel preparation. And there is a, uh, an oral vaccine that you can take now. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but you, you do it, you, you take it the first dose and then you take your second dose, I think two years later or something. Uh, and that is designed to, um, uh, maybe it's not a vaccine, maybe it's an antibiotic, but it's designed to prevent traveler's diarrhea <clears throat> prophylactically. Um, so I didn't get sick and I, I'm the kind of guy that if somebody's going to get sick, it would be me. So we have been, we've traveled enough now to know that, you know, if you're going to a place where there's not a lot of refrigeration and it's really, really warm and there's a lot of fresh vegetables, you better be careful and careful of, of all the things you're supposed to be careful of, you know, drinking water, um, unpeeled vegetables, all that kind of thing. I tend to not worry about it anymore because, um, um, because for one thing, we make sure that we, we are prepared before we go. And then we always have um, uh, ciprofloxacin with us. Um, so that if I start to get sick, I'll give it maybe 24 hours. And then if I'm to the point where I'm not holding down food or got diarrhea, <clears throat> I'm going on a ciprofloxacin right away. We always make sure you bring at least two doses of that with us each. Some of our friends who are uh, uh, not quite as adequately prepared brought things like charcoal pills, which is like a, um, probably not the appropriate thing to do. Um, Pepto-Bismol is a really good thing. You don't want to, you do not want to take anything that's going to plug you up, but Pepto-Bismol, which is sort of lines the coating of your stomach, can provide really, really good relief for people that are not feeling well. It's not going to make you better. It's not a, an antibiotic, but it's going to make the symptoms a lot better. So if I get sick, I'm going to be taking Pepto-Bismol and the antibiotic. And what about souvenirs? Souvenirs, well, uh, I have a salt and pepper shaker that doesn't work. <laughs> but they had beautiful salt and pepper shakers on the boat. We tried to buy them. We couldn't get them. Um, what else? I always pick up something. I should tell a story about my ukulele, though, because the ukulele... Sure. Uh, uh, has been all, all over the world. And like I said, it, it always, it opens up a lot of doors and creates a lot of, uh, good memories. But I, when I went through security at the airport in Cairo, um, they made me, they, they put the ukulele through the, uh, machine and they noticed it was a round egg looking thing inside of my, my ukulele, um, uh, uh box container. And, the guy made me take it out and he took it and he said, he, he said, this, open this. It was a little shaker that I used for, for percussion. And the guy insisted that I open it, but you can't open it because if you open it, it's broken, it's ruined. Mm -hmm. So instead I took it and I said, it's for music. And he recoiled. He thought maybe I had a bomb or something. And then when he realized what it was, he said, give me that. And so I gave him the shaker and he got up and he left. And I thought, oh, that goes my shaker. And I, I could hear him in the back talking to his boss and all the other guys shaking it. And he's just like, then he came back and gave it to me. So then when we got to the hotel, uh, they saw my ukulele and they took it away from me. It was confiscated for the entire time that we were in the hotel in Cairo. And I asked them why. And they I got, I got a few different answers. One was security. And the other was forbidden music. They... Do not want you playing music in a room. It's culturally, it is not appropriate. So they are, I guess, afraid that I was going to start playing my ukulele in the room and have some people over and start playing some songs. And so I was required to leave the ukulele at uh, the security desk until we left. Interesting. Eh? 
different cultural things. Yeah, you, yeah. and you, you don't argue, you gotta go with the flow. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. You, a ukulele could be so dangerous. So you talked a bit about the political situation and that mostly you didn't feel it too much, except at one point you talked about you had a lot more security. In Cairo, for sure. In Cairo, there was, uh, um, we had every time the hotel, we had a, um, a x-ray security system we had to go through. We weren't patted down at the hotel, but we were eyed very carefully. Once they saw it was us, so to speak, the people that were staying there, they kind of left us alone. But we had to go through a, uh, a metal detector scanner thing every time we entered the hotel. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you wonder if the machine was working. So the security was intense, but I'm not sure it was working all that well. And when we got to the Sinai, uh, when we got to Sharm el Sheikh, and then we did the day trips into the Sinai Peninsula, the security was, was pretty intense there because there had been some extremist actions that had happened there in the not too distant past, past, yeah, including the shooting down of a commercial airplane, actually. No problems in the airport or? No, no. Uh, this, there's a lot of security, a lot of security, and there's a lot of security going to the, um, uh, going to uh, the, the Great Pyramids, going there. Once you get in there, it was all fine. There was no security inside. It was all a free-for-all. Uh, Cairo was fairly intense security-wise. The security and all the little places that we were at on the Dahabi was non-existent. There just was nobody there. Just the locals just trying to do their thing. So again, in terms of the experience, again, I, I, I would recommend, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of, you know, depending how, how your trip unfolds, but it was really nice to do the Dahabia first and just have this exploration of the, the best parts of Egypt, um, culturally and in terms of um, just um, it being quiet and remote. And then rather than going straight into the hustle and bustle of Cairo, I mean, if your, if your trip requires it, it'd be done that way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it was really nice to get adjusted and mm -hmm. to spend that time just really relaxing. And then have the more the intense aspects of the trip with uh, Cairo and Alexandria. And then winding down at the Red Sea was, was also uh, just a great way to, to, to wrap things up. So how many weeks altogether were you? Well, we had, we had actually spent two weeks in Bordeaux on a bike trip, bicycle trip before this. And then we were in Egypt for about three weeks, I guess. I, and then we went to Jordan for a week after that. And then we flew home from a man, Jordan. So we were gone, I think, about six weeks. And really, really good time of the year to go, which it was November, I think early November. It's shoulder season in Canada. Um, uh, Egypt can be, like, especially in, um, in Aswan, Abu Simbel, it can be really, really brutally hot there. You would not want to go there during the hot season. when It's above the equator, so it would be, if you went there in July or something, it would, it would be horrible. Um, for us, being there in November, the highs were still, you know, 30, 32, something like that. And it was quite a bit lower in, in uh, Cairo, you know, maybe highs of 24, 26. Really good time of year to go, um, late fall. So I always ask everybody at the end if they would go back. Yeah, for sure. Um, the world's a big place and uh, we do a lot of travel and there's lots of places that I have. We've been to a lot of places, but there's lots of places we haven't been to. So absolutely, I would go back. Absolutely, I recommend it. Um, will we go back? Um, maybe, but there's lots of, uh, lots of paths to trod before that. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your trip with us, especially some place that um, not everybody gets to, but it's very encouraging to hear that uh, you had a good experience. Yeah, thanks Priscilla. Yes, so we'll see you all next month in May when we'll be having a kayak trip to Haida Gwaii.